Welcome to Left, Right, and You with Tim Elins and Paul Edwards. They're talking current events, politics, local, state, and federal. Now here's Tim Elins and Paul Edwards and Left, Right, and You. Well, good afternoon, everybody. This is Tim Elins here. Paul Edwards is not with us this week, and he didn't trust me to do the show alone, so... <laughs> He, we have a special guest with us today, Jeff Ward, a columnist with Beacon News, Courier News, and he's going to co-host with me. Hello, Jeff. Hey, Tim. Thanks for having me. It's great. I'm glad you're here today. And we are going to spend an entire hour with uh, attorney Joel Brodsky, who uh, is on uh, the phone with us. And uh, Drew Peterson's attorney. That's um, who, among others. Among <laughs> others? Yeah, it's not his only client. No, but that would be, of course, the, the, the main topic of interest to so, folks these days. Mr. Brosky, are you with us? Yes, I am. Okay, thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Jeff said, what should we call you? I said, I think it'd be okay if we called you Joel. I hope so. Okay. <laughs> Good. Welcome. My, thank you. My pleasure. Also, you know, it's funny you should say, talk about Peterson, but, you know, a case that's actually brought a little, almost more publicity, at least nationwide, is that uh, Joseph Reyes case where the guy was uh, almost held in contempt for taking his daughter to church. Oh, yeah. yeah they just made more news. Uh, nationally and even internationally than, than Peterson, which is really kind of local to Illinois. Yeah, Jeff and I think I disagree a little bit. I mean, well, we do agree on that, that, that article that you had written, but I, I don't think being an un, unfavorable character is against the law. I agree. Yeah, I think we, we talked about that a little bit. And um, Joel, we, you, I guess, you know, when you and I were talking about coming on the show and and uh, yeah, I know, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you about that case, but oh, that was a big case. You won that case too, right? Yeah. They, they threw that out, right? The yeah, that, thank, thank God. I mean, I would have hated to see a, a man go to jail for taking his daughter to church. You know, it would be really. I think the judge did the right thing in that case. But wasn't it? Didn't it? Was it like he violated an order? Wasn't it that the judge gave an order? And wasn't it not necessarily break the law? Was it he? he what he did is he broke a judicial order. Is yes. that different? Well, that's what they. That's what they alleged. Okay. They broke a judicial order. Uh, but the question is, you know, they said don't expose, the order was don't expose your child to any religion other than the Jewish religion. And, and his, his position was, look, look at, I'm, you know, where does that end? Does that mean I can't uh, take the, make my daughter to see Santa Claus? Does that mean I can't take her to see a Christmas tree? He thought that the order was, was so vague that, uh, you know, that, that it was really unenforceable. And we never got it because we won at the contempt level. We never got to challenge that before the appellate court, which we were planning on doing. But uh, you know, the judge I think you know, saw that what was going on and did the, you know did the right thing and and just sent him on his way and said that look, uh, you're no harm. Taking your daughter to church can ne- can never pot- even potentially be a harm to the child, and that's what this is all about. And, and he just uh, you know let him go. With, let him just let him go. That's what that was the right thing to do. But the sad thing is, that, Joel, they didn't really answer the question, so yeah, Mr. Reyes can find himself right back in the same position. Or, or some other people. There's other cases in the circuit court right now that are dealing with this very issue about, you know, uh, uh, parents from different religious backgrounds uh-huh. who are now divorced and are fighting over the religious upbringing of the child, and it's. Um, you know, it's an issue that really needs to be addressed. It's it's going to be uh, it's going to be coming up uh, again and again, especially as more you know interfaith marriages break up because there were a lot of interfaith marriages, you know, in the uh, in the last ten or fifteen years, a lot more than before, and, and mm-hmm. the rate of divorce they're just starting to break up now, and the people have children, and this is an issue that's going to be coming up again and again until they finally resolve it. Was the faith one of the reasons why uh, the couple broke up? Uh, in that particular case, no, no. Uh, okay. He caught his, his white cheek. You, so. you know, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, Dave was... No, he answered my yeah. question. I, it, you know, it seems to me that but I, I don't know why, but it, and this kind of brings into my thought. I'm trying to think of how to frame this question. It seems like pretty much the a prosecutor or a court you know, a judge could just say that this is it. And you have to spend thousands, tens of thousands of dollars mm-hmm. to go through the process. And, and I, if you've listened to the show before, I talk about the Second Amendment. In the Chicago deal, uh, mm-hmm. when two years ago Washington D.C. goes in front of the Supreme Court, after all this rigmarole, the Supreme Court rules something, and then Chicago basically says, "Too bad." And then two years later, somebody takes Chicago to task on the Second Amendment. Supreme Court makes a ruling, and Chicago just changes the rules of the game. 
And yeah. it, it seems to me. And so I here a question. Maybe you don't know the answer to this. What happened to all those people that were convicted under that Chicago gun ban for the last 25 years? Do they get their convictions thrown out now that the Supreme Court had ruled that that law was unconstitutional? Well, that, that's a that's a great question. Um, I suppose that there's going to be a lot of uh, of uh, applications for pardons uh, or for expungements. Um, and, you know, I don't know if they can get them vacated. Um, you know, I've seen a lot of challenges now. People have a lot of calls for people who have got arre- who got arrested on, uh, U- on UUW. We call it UUW okay. uh, unauthorized use of weapons uh, charges uh, for for handguns that are now uh, you know uh, trying to get those uh, reopened. Uh, a lot of, some of those even felony convictions, um, and there's going to be some litiga- litigation about that. I, I personally think if it's you know if, it, if it's unconstitutional, it's, it's unconstitutional, and, and any conviction should be should be vacated. That's my personal belief. I mean, it wasn't exactly as if the Second Amendment was very unclear on the subject. <laughs> no, I, I again, and I'm not a gun person. I'm not an RA guy, but it was pretty clear to me. And, and maybe I'm framing the questions a little bit wrong, but I know I know uh, my my partner here, Jeff, wants to jump into this uh, hearsay deal. Oh, but, whenever but, you're ready, Tim. And, and if we say, if, and I don't know what you're allowed to talk about or not talk about, so if there's something off, you know, off uh, base, just say you know, I well, can't anything, talk about that. Yeah, I, I, I will. Okay. But I mean, it's pretty pretty much any, anything except something that's privileged I, I, or a matter of discovery. I can't. Other okay. Than that, I mean, certainly the hearsay topic is. Uh, is open for discussion. And that's pretty clear to me that you have a right to face your accuser. I think that that's one of our basic rights in the Constitution. And what if you have to go to trial under this state law and you lose because of the hearsay? <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry. I, I, and I'll yeah, just... It's, 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 yeah, it, it's, it is kind of crazy. You know, the, the, the reason it is, the, the reason behind the, the law really is that we... Can, in trial lawyers can tell you this more than anybody. Uh, Cross examination is the engine of truth. Um, when somebody gets up there and tells you a story, you know that's the easy part. And then they got to answer the cross examination. They got to answer questions about their story, and that's where the truth comes out. If you, if a case, if somebody stands up to cross, if their story stands up to a stiff cross examination of somebody that's really that's prepared to cross examine, uh, you know that's statement probably is the truth. Um, and I've seen many, many you know, accusations fall apart under cross-examination. But you can't cross-examine hearsay. You can't cross-examine so-and-so told me so-and-so. And, and that's the whole point. You know, there's no way to defend against hearsay. That's, and that uh, comes to points. One, uh, it's difficult to defend about, and second of all, it's extremely you know a devastating testimony. You know, if somebody says to you, um, "Yes, uh, Bob told me that he saw John, uh, you know, uh, beat the hell out of his wife," um, you know, and it was in a battery case where the guy's accused of beating up his wife. I mean, it's it's devastating testimony, and there's no way to defend against it, even though the guy might be lying. So, so Joel, you know, in last May I wrote a column that, that basically said, you know, the, the price of living in a free society may be someone like Drew Peterson walking the streets. And, and I really took exception to the hearsay rule, but as an attorney, how do you try a case where they're changing the rules to go after your client and folks like Craig Stebbick? How do you how do you even begin to try that case? Well, it's, it's, it's well, we, we actually what we did do is we had that five week hearing on hearsay, um, and we were able to show that the vast majority. I mean, I mean, it gets, I can't really. I mean, obviously, technically, the the ruling is sealed, even though it somehow okay. leaked out. But I think it's pretty clear that the vast majority of this of what the state wanted didn't come in. That's why they appealed, obviously. Um, and I think, you know, you, we were able to show that uh, with, with a great deal of effort. It was, uh, I think this was the longest pretrial hist- uh, hearing in, in, in Illinois history that, that most, the majority of what they wanted to, to, uh, to introduce wasn't reliable. And the Judge White, uh, you know, to his credit, you know, said, I'm not going to let, let unreliable evidence into a trial, not in his courtroom anyway. And, um, and then, so that's that's what we did. I mean, that's the only way to defend about it is just to try to stop it from getting in. Once it gets in before a jury, 
it's extremely difficult to try that case. Let me let me tell you. I mean, I've consulted with some of the best lawyers in the country. I tried to. I consulted with. Uh, I mean, people uh, Shapiro and uh, California, and we talked. Tried to you know deal with uh, with other renowned attorneys and say, how do you cross-examine hearsay? And you know, not, nobody had a strategy for doing it. And it's 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 really a problem. It, and it's growing. I think you see more and more hearsay, more and more hearsay laws, you know, more and more liberalization of uh, rules of evidence. And what this is unfortunately going to lead to is wrongful convictions. And essentially you have to then try. You're really trying two cases, as, such as it is. One, yeah. you're fighting for the Constitution, and one, you're fighting for your client. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, you have to really look at what what um, this whole appeal and uh, that's going on now over this the results of that of that hearsay hearing we had. Uh, we we got the results which we were happy with. We were ready to go to trial, and um, then uh, Mr. Glasgow decided he's going to appeal it. And in his appeal, he's saying that uh, you know just because it's unreliable, the judge found the evidence to be unreliable, doesn't mean it shouldn't come into evidence. That even if it's unreliable evidence, the hearsay should come in even if a judge found it unreliable after a hearing. And, you know, I, I would just keep shaking my head. I'm thinking to myself, my God, what he's saying, he wants to convict somebody, uh, not just on hearsay, but on unreli- unreliable hearsay. And, you know, it's, that's a scary thought, uh, that somebody could spend the rest of their life in prison because the jury got to hear hearsay, and hearsay that the judge has already found to be unreliable. It's just a very, very uh, scary proposition. But, you know, let's just for a minute say that they allowed this in and that, uh, again, I think the Constitution is as clear to me as it is on the Second Amendment, that you have a right to face your accusers. Uh, I understand that you can't, when somebody's deceased, you can't can't cross-examine them. But so are you saying that if they did allow this, you did go through and they did get a conviction, you'd have to go through the process and take it all the way through the court systems? Yeah, we, we, well, we would certainly appeal it. Um, uh-huh. you know, there's no question about that. Um, but you can't do that before that? They mean, somebody no, can't challenge the law before somebody's life has to suffer? No, believe it or not, a uh, defendant does not have the right, a uh, criminal defendant, does not have a right to an, what they call an interlocutory or an appeal before the trial. Only the state does. And, um, you know, so we're, we're stuck. You know, the, the idea is, well, if you're found not guilty, you don't need an appeal. And if, you know, you're found guilty, then you you're, you have a right to an appeal. And it takes years. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, I I'm, I can think of cases like David, remember the Dwallaby case? Dwallaby. I do yeah, remember. He was, he was uh, Judge Neville many, many years ago. This man was, was wrongfully convicted of uh, murdering his, his daughter. And uh, I do spent remember. Year, uh, spent a couple of years in prison before he was uh, he was exonerated. Um, there was somebody up in Lake County, Illinois, recently, a man who spent... Five years. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, who spent years in jail and, until DNA cleared him. Um, I mean, it's, um, it's, it's uh, scary. But you know, I mean, that's that's our, our system, though, is um, that you're held in cut, you know, you're held in custody, and, uh, you know, until the until the trial. So that's yeah. But no, no, I'm sorry, can I interrupt you a second? Yeah. What is about in the Constitution about a right to speedy trial? Or uh, yeah. is that a good question? Yeah, <laughs> and that's that's another yeah, that's another issue we, we've been we've been dealing with too, because Drew's now been in basically isolation for 18 months. Uh, locked in a room, you know, the size of most people's bedroom. Uh, getting out into a, another room about the size of somebody's bedroom, uh, a small bedroom. Um, that's called his day room. You know, a couple hours a day, and that's that's it. That's his existence. Um, you have a right under Illinois law. If you're in custody, if you demand a trial, they have to give you a trial within 120 days. And there's some small exceptions to this rule, but I mean. Are they subjective? No, no. It, it's very, it, it's not very much at all. It, they're very objective. The, the exceptions are for DNA testing and such, but uh, it's uh, really doesn't apply in most cases. So it's really they have to give you your trial in 120 days. But where the state appeals, uh, and then your speedy trial rights are suspended. You don't get a speedy trial right, um, except that they're supposed to let you out of jail, though. But they can, but unfortunately, they holding Drew because they said that they felt that 
he was a um, a danger, which really didn't make well, sense. Who's they? Who's they? The state or the, the state court? Is not yet a, the court. Ruled the court Drew okay. shouldn't be released pending appeal because he's a danger. And this appellate process now has been dragging out since July, and he's just been sitting in jail with no right to a speedy trial. And I just um, and this was like a five year difference from the time of the crime, and he was out and pretty yeah, kept mean, his nose clean. Well, much. yeah, he certainly has never been. Drew's never been convicted of anything, uh-huh. uh, not 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 any crime whatsoever. Um, and you know, and certainly why he was out even after um, the Stacy Peterson's uh, disappearance. Um, he certainly had an opportunity, more than enough opportunities if he wanted to flee. You know, he, he certainly could have. The opening line in that column was, so they finally nailed the most elusive criminal. <laughs> you know, I mean, no, he, he's been right in, in plain sight. Whether or not, I don't think people understand that, that if they come for Drew Peterson, they can come for us. And if, if his rights are being violated, they can violate our rights. Well, yeah, it's it's um, it's kind of scary when you get uh, when you're focused on, and this is what what I think is very very scary when the, when the criminal justice system, when a prosecutor with all their powers, you know, focuses on somebody and says, "I want that person," and is willing to use every single you know power, every single um, uh, Tool. Every, the tool, tool that they have at so, their yeah. Yeah, exactly every single tool they have at their disposal, and even are willing to write new laws to do it. You know that's that's uh, it's a frightening process. It's very frightening, and, and you know you count you count on a jury. You say, well, you know, I'll be able to put twelve citizens up there, you know, uh, and they'll be able to protect me. That's my protection. You know, twelve citizens. But you got to get there first. Yeah, and that's the point. We've been trying to get there now for two years, and we can't get this case before a jury. And, and does the judge have any uh, chutzpah, or do they? I mean, well, I, I was I was really looking forward to going to trial uh, before um, you know, uh, Judge Stephen Peterson. I, I mean, Judge Stephen White. I'm sorry, uh, who was here to hearsay. I mean, he was. I mean, Steve. He was, Judge White was probably one of the best trial judges I ever had the pleasure uh, of trying a case before. He was um, just phenomenal when it came to actual. Trial. I would say that there's probably other great legal scholars out there who may be, you know, uh, in the minutia of the law and tripping through Supreme Court cases, may be, you know, uh, superior to Judge White. But when it came to trying a case, he was hands down the best I've ever been in front of. And, um, uh, you know, now, unfortunately, he's retired. Uh, but he, uh, he would have been, I think he, I think we would have got a just result from him. I think he wasn't brooking any any garbage. He wasn't going to lend any unreliable evidence, and he was going to say, present your evidence, uh, but it's not, we're not going to let, you know, we had the state at the, uh, at the, at the hearsay hearing, he had a, a, a person who was a, a card reader, you know, a, a, a tarot card reader. Uh, he wasn't going to let stuff like that in. Uh, he, you know, he wasn't going to let uh, garbage evidence in. And um, and he was a, would have been great to try that case in front of. Unfortunately, they appealed, and we, we just couldn't couldn't get the trial. Hey, Joe, I have a question. Are you defending uh, uh, Stephen Peterson? No, no, he's uh, has a uh, very fine lawyer, Tamara Cummings, who's the uh, the uh, from the uh, Fraternal Order of Police. Okay, who, and who's he, defending him? And they're they're what, what's the reason behind the uh, the behind the uh, Oak Brook wants to uh, uh, fire Stephen Peterson? Right, I believe. right, right. Um, and they're, they're <laughs> yeah, in fact, I was I was uh, talking to Tamara today, um, and uh, they're, they're the trial. Isn't that kind of weird? Uh, yeah, talking I mean, to Tamara today? That's weird. Tamara. 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 They're start resuming the hearing on Thursday, and um, um, to, to terminate. And I guess what they what they really seem to be saying is that, um, you know, he shouldn't have taken possession of what. They they keep saying is it was yeah. an illegal weapon, but the fact is it's not an illegal weapon for police officers, and that's already been found. You know, there's there's Judge uh, Shane said it, uh, Will County said that this is not an illegal weapon for for police officers. Are they but, trying to put the are they you, is there does it look like they're trying to put the squeeze on this for because of uh, him being the son of Drew Peterson? Well, I remember this is the uh, third time they've tried to discipline Stephen. The other two have. Uh, also have failed mm-hmm. the third time. In the first one, when they had the hearing during that, uh, during the hear the first hearing, uh, the police chief referred to Stephen as Drew six times during the mm-hmm. hearing. So I, I, we know where his mind is. Um, so 
you know, um, yes, they're they're clearly trying to uh, a bias. You try to get to Drew through through Stephen, um, and hmm. and then you know, unfortunately, he you know, or fortunately for Stephen, he's got you know they got the very fine police union that's standing behind him, providing him with a lawyer, and uh, and his fellow officers are also standing behind him. So hopefully he'll be able to defeat this attempt to uh, to squeeze him too. I was just going to say, um, we're going to open up our phone lines, um, 847-931-1410. We have Joe Brodsky on the phone, attorney, um, well-known attorney, had a lot of cases here. If anybody has any questions, please call in. We're going to go to a break in a couple of minutes. Yeah, we're going to call it two in. So were you saying, was that in Oak Brook? Is that the city? Yeah. Is that in Oak- Will County? No, Oak Brook's in uh, DuPage. Okay. Yeah, it seems like there's some really weird stuff. If I ever get in trouble, I don't ever want to get in trouble in Will County or Clark County in Nevada. Those just seem <laughs> to be the, the two places where they have these rules that they kind of make them up. The, the guy that was before Glasgow, he was kind of a crazy uh, well, I, st- I, state's I'm, attorney, too. Maricopa County, Arizona. Maricopa <laughs> County. <laughs> but uh, got to work. <laughs> Judge Arpaio. The, uh, I mean that was an embarrassment. I know, and I tell you, there's some really good lawyers. I've, I've had nothing but. You know, I can't. I can't say that I agree with what Mr. Glasgow was doing. Uh, there's no question about that. Glasgow, he, I don't know, mis- mispronounced it. Look at mad at me. Uh, is doing, but they've got some very uh, fine prosecutors down there in, in Will County. Uh, John Connor, who heads their major crime task force, is as a was finest state attorney as I've ever seen. Um, some, some of the other ones that have worked on that case are are, are top notch people. Um, but you know, it just um, I don't know where the problem lies. I mean, they had some problems with that one police officer that they arrested who uh, on that uh, supposed serial killing, and then the um, the case where um, Fox, no. yeah, Fox. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, is it bad luck? Is it just circumstances? Um, you know. You remember a lot of that county is, is unincorporated, um, and um, I know that the sheriff's department is, uh, who had a cover on the unincorporated areas, has been suffering some very uh, budget cuts because of the economy. Um, you know, the, uh, and obviously the more money, you know, law enforcement, the more money you spend, the higher quality people you get, the more forensic work you can do. Uh, I, I really don't know what the answer to the question is, why they've had several problems out there lately, but. You know, in my experience out there, I mean, the quality of lawyering out there and the quality of judging has been has been phenomenal. I, I'm I've been very impressed with it. It's just that, you know, for some reason, uh, when when it comes to Drew Peterson, um, there just seems to be um, blinders as far as uh, you know his rights and 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 you know why and what's going on with his case. And, and I don't know why, but it just seems that. He's the exception to the rule, and there shouldn't be any exceptions to any rules when it comes to criminal prosecutions. Everybody should be the same. Is there any precedence on this kind of uh, case? I mean, where they they botched the uh, the forensic before they buried somebody, exhumed the body, made a different ruling, you know, had an accidental death, continued to a homicide. Well, I've, I've, there's certainly been exhumation, autopsies, and and and, and, and prosecutions based on those. Um, uh, I think um, there was that uh, Medgar Evers, a civil rights uh, worker. They did an ex- he uh, his murderer was prosecuted based on a, you know they had to exhume the body and do an autopsy. And I mean it happens. Uh, it's problematic um, for the for the uh, you know for the prosecutor and the pathologist involved. I mean there's a lot of issues that come up with with uh, over time and memories fade and evidence gets bad and uh, witnesses <laughs> disappear, but. Um, it's um, it's it's you know it happens. I mean it's it's um, it's it's a they probably want to, more of those cases are probably not prosecuted than are prosecuted because of those problems. And obviously you never hear about the ones that aren't prosecuted. You only hear about the well, ones yeah, that are. it's just bizarre that they have the guy that forensic guy that they bring in within it seemed like about ten minutes. He goes, oh, this is this is not an accidental thing. Yeah, I mean the first the first thought the first initial autopsy. Um, I mean, once again, this is discovery material, so I really okay, can't get into sure. detail about it. Okay, but um, you know, there was a reason they've they had a cup. They've had two subsequent uh, experts come in to kind of try to verify okay. what what he said. So uh, I mean, I wasn't. 
there's, there's issues. Obviously, when this case does eventually go to trial and their experts testify and our experts testify, it'll come I, out. I think a lot of the things are going to be made crystal clear to people don't really uh, think about. Joel, I, I got to cut you off here because we got to do a station break oh. for a couple minutes. Can you hang in there with us? Uh, absolutely. Because we, we really are getting into this, and I'm enjoying this. It's really uh, good. I'm here. Thank I'm you. enjoying this, too. Okay, we'll be right back. You're going to do a couple commercials, and then we'll be right back to you.